Germany and living in the Netherlands already since 2006, currently living in Nijmegen, working for the Radboud University. And yeah, as already mentioned, I want to tell you about YEMA and verifiable credentials and subtitle how to authenticate in a decentralized, privacy friendly, and more reliable manner across systems. Yeah. So, first, I want to talk about the, the, yeah, one of the current issues with identity management. That is, it's centralized in the, traditionally. So I give one example. This is one model, but there are also other models. But for now, let's keep it also simple. And um, yeah, this is me. I want to authenticate or request a service at my health insurer, VGZ, which is the service provider in this case. And so I was requesting a service, and in order to be able to access the service, I need to authenticate. And how does this work in the Netherlands? Usually, the service provider asks DGD, which is the identity provider, one of the identity providers in the Netherlands owned by the government, to authenticate to certain services. And so the service provider asks DGD, is this really Daniel? And then I need to authenticate at DGD, and DGD then gives the OK to the service provider that I'm indeed Daniel. So in case of extreme events, uh, we clearly see that this central party, the identity provider DGD, is one of the bottlenecks. Because we have seen in the past that there were um, denial of service uh, attacks also on DGT and it was not available for some time and also quality of service issues. So, their researchers and industry are working on solutions worldwide. One of them is IRMA, standing for I Reveal My Attributes, developed at the Radboud University uh, some years ago and it advertises itself on their website with uh, having the digital passport on your phone. Currently, it's maintained by SEDN, which is also responsible for maintaining the NL domain. And um, yeah, one of the interesting -ish things about IMA is that it's completely open source, so you can look up all the source code on GitHub. And it implements partly the IBM's IDMX specification. That IDMX stands for Identity Mixer, and it's a cryptographic protocol suite for privacy preserving authentication. If you want to learn more about the implementation of IDMX within IEMA, then I invite you to go to the talk in the evening of Maya and Sietze, also sitting here which will tell you at 9 p.m. today in the Abacus about EMAS EDMX implementation, the crypto behind selective unlinkable attribute disclosure. So how does EMA then work and also similar systems? Uh, we have two independent processes. First, the issuance, and second, the disclosure. First, doing issuance. For instance, the government in the Netherlands can issue me a personal data credential, which consists of my name, my birth date, and for instance, also my address. So this credential will then, after I authenticate to the government with DGD, will be transferred to my phone, and me, as the owner of the credential, is then, yeah, can can disclose this credential whenever I want. A credential consists of uh, yeah, certain uh, um, properties. So first, it's bound to the phone via some cryptographic tricks. 
and uh, it contains metadata from which issuer it's issued, for instance, the Dutch government, also when it was issued and when the credential expires. Also, logically, it contains then attributes, and most importantly, also the issuer's signature, because the issuer signs all attributes such that another party, the verifier, can verify that the credential and the containing attributes are indeed valid and issued by that issuer. So if I now want to use those credentials, um, I can go to a service provider and the service provider requests then that I need to prove something. For instance, that I'm above 18 years old. So where do I need to want to disclose such information, for instance, when I want to buy some liquor at the Khal Khal. So the Khal Khal is in this case a service provider, and he wants to know that I'm indeed above 18 years old. So the trust model in this case is that the Khal Khal trusts the government that the government issues valid credentials to the rightful citizen. However, doing, doing disclosure, the Khal and Khal does not need to talk with the government. So this is privacy preserving in that sense that the government doesn't learn as identity provider when I use the credential in question. So that's one of the advantages of this decentralized identity model. So zooming a bit in, uh, how does a session in EMA work? First, we go to a website, and yeah, I chose now to have uh, an example of Verifier. The Verifier then starts a session at an EMA server, which the Verifier can run himself. Um, after initiating the session at the EMA server, the EMA server returns some session information, and based on the session information, the verifier can create and show a QR code to the user. Then the user scans the QR code, so the EMA app uh, gets information about the session, and subsequently the EMA app also requests uh, the information which attributes need to be disclosed. And then the user can choose. Uh, uh, with an EMI, it's possible to also make a, a construction that a user has a choice which attributes to disclose. And um, yeah, then he can select in the app and disclose the attributes. And then in the end, the verifier can look up at the EMI server if the disclosure was indeed successful and valid. Now, one practical use case I want to refer to, because I'm currently working on it, is uh, PostGuard. It's, um, we, we, with, in PostGuard, we have the goal to make email encryption accessible for everybody, so it's easy to use. Um, yeah, we all know the issues, the usability issues with open PGP, right? And how we do that is by utilizing identity-based or attribute-based encryption. Uh, in this concept, we have a private key generator, which is a trusted third party. So that's also an issue. We'll, we'll talk about it in a second. And if Alice wants to encrypt for her doctor, Bob, for instance, um, she just needs the identity of Bob, for instance, his email address, and some attribute related to that he is a doctor, and the public key of the public key generator. And then Alice can encrypt the mail. Then we ship the mail via our well-known SMTP protocol to, to Bob, but all the payload is encrypted during transport, and Bob can then decrypt by proving his identity via EMA to the private key generator. And if the private key generator then uh, validates the disclosure, it generates a user secret key that matches the identity with which Alice encrypted. And then Bob can decrypt the email. 
So this decentralized and user-centric identity uh, systems are also referred to uh, nowadays more often as self-sovereign identity systems. Christopher Allen uh, published an article in 2016 uh, titled The Path to Self-Sovereign Identity, where he also lists 10 different principles such a system should adhere to. Unfortunately, it's also often associated with distributed ledger technology uh, because uh, the bigger parties such as IBM uh, really yeah, use it for marketing purposes to sell their yeah, distributed ledger technology more. More recently, um, in Germany, there were some projects uh, called ID Wallet and the digital school certificates based on distributed ledger technologies and the principles of self-sovereign identity, but as we've seen, uh, those projects failed at the moment, so they are not online anymore, and yeah, I think they will further work on it, but um, also the uh, Bundeszentrale für Sicherheits- and Informationstechnologie, the BSI, uh, discourages the use of distributed ledger technologies in such decentralized user-centric identity systems. Also interestingly, um, recently uh, the U European Union announced that there is a European Digital Identity Initiative. There is still a call for proposals. The deadline is on the 17th of August uh, 22. And they asked for yeah, um, uh, 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 yeah, the industry and researchers to submit solutions uh, per country and um, with the goal to have per country maybe one, one system uh, deployed in the end and that those systems are then interoperable. Such, so if I now travel with my credentials to Germany that I can also use my Dutch credentials in Germany to authenticate and for example to prove that I'm above 18 years old. Also, sure, Yema is also participating in this. So there is also some discussion, especially in Germany, um, that there are also some drawbacks with self-sovereign identity or decentralized and user-centric identity systems in general. Um, some of those arguments are nicely written down by Lilith Wettmann. My German friends here will probably uh, yeah, hear about her in the last two years. So, and she argues that with self-sovereign identity systems, service providers have verified, verified data stored, and those are more valuable for criminals. Also, once you have such an infrastructure deployed, it's also easier to add identification obligations in the future. Also, states often leave it to the market to develop solutions. And then the question is, okay, what's, what's the business model then for those organizations, right? How do they want to earn money with their identity? Do we want that as a society? And, yeah, citizens are then becoming responsible for maintaining their credentials within their phone. So what happens if someone commits fraud with them? Who is liable for this? Uh, one of the goals of the European digital identity was to make such platforms interoperable, right? What I said, so you can go from uh, travel from Germany to the Netherlands and then use the credential from one country in another country. So one of the current issues is that there is no standard defined how different ad identity apps, such as IMA, It's Me, Schluss, or the American Sovereign, talk to each other, right? How to exchange credentials between systems such that I can, for instance, have my personal data credential from EMAS stored within my EMA app and someone deploys an It's Me server and then can verify my EMA credentials within an It's Me system. This uh, W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, developed a a standard called Verifiable Credentials Data Model, and it became a recommendation 
version 1.0 in uh, May 2020, I think. And in the meantime, they also updated some minor things, so, so it became a 1.1 version. Um, so important to see here is that in this proposal contains a data model, which is an unambiguous specification defining walls, the interaction between walls and related concepts, and also providing a syntax, uh, usually in JSON, so we will, uh, I will give a little example in a bit. So if we now look at the walls and information flow of uh, the verifiable credentials data model, we see clearly some similarities with the IMA system. Right? We have here an issuer that issues credentials. We have a holder or a user that needs to store the credentials in a, within a wallet app on the phone. Then we have a verifier on the right end that yeah, requests credentials and verifies them. And on the bottom, we see we have a verifiable data registry that maintains identifiers and schemes. So I didn't talk about this yet, but I will do in a bit. And with an EMR, yeah, we have the similar concepts. So an EMR scheme is uh, yeah, very important because it contains information about the issuer, uh, which credentials an issuer may issue, and also the public keys of the issuers that a verifier needs to be able to yeah, verify that the credentials are indeed valid. So the EMA scheme is distributed via the EMA scheme manager. So it's hosted on GitHub. And every instance of an EMA yeah, service or the EMA app regularly pulls the most recent version of the official EMA scheme so it uh, stays up to date. However, in the verified credential data model, uh, the, the, yes, it, it works a bit differently. So for instance, as you can see here, the, the green row within, uh, within this except example, uh, we see a URL that links to to, yeah, if dereferenced contains some information about the issuer, and I think most importantly contains the public key of the issuer, so anyone receiving this credential can verify it. So what I did within, within my work is developing a metadata server within the EMR system, such that external parties can request information about the issuer and about the credentials used by offering two uh, distinct endpoints, the issuer and the schema endpoint. Um, yeah, so we can conform to the verifiable credential data model. So the prototype I built, uh, to summarize, is providing this metadata server a uh, wrapper with an EMR Go. EMR Go is a central component with which you can uh, run an EMR server, but also parts are used within the app um, to compute verifiable credential compliant messages. Also, I showed that uh, we can exchange verifiable credential compliant messages between different EMR components. So during uh, my study, I was not able, uh, due to time constraints, to find other parties, for instance, it's me or Sovereign, that want to work together with me to, to show that we can indeed exchange information between different systems. So the source code is also available on, uh, on my GitHub. I forked the EMA Go and the EMA mobile repositories. And to, to wrap it up, I think, how was the time? Um, so what I just said, the prototype shows how to compute VC compliant messages within IEMA. By conforming to the verifiable credential data model, IEMA's interoperability increases. However, one of the most important things to discuss still is that the APIs and the cryptos 
uh, a system implements can differ in each system, and that's also the biggest challenge. That, yeah, for instance, IMA utilizes uh, the IB, IBM's IDEMIX uh, specification to, to implement some protocols, but other systems can implement other crypto. <clears throat> so how do you make sure each system understands crypto of all the other systems, right? I think that's one of the most complicated things uh, in this whole yeah, very favorable credential um, yeah, standard. I think we have a similar discussion currently about making messenger apps interoperable. I think there we have kind of the similar challenges. So on a more higher level, um, we can state that with decentral identity management platforms, we can improve the re reliability during extreme events because we are not relying on a central identity provider. Um, there are also several decentralized and user-centric products available on the market, as we've seen in EMR, for instance, and Schluss in the Netherlands, and It's Me in Belgium, which is really used heavily there by citizens. Um, yeah, the BSI states that it doesn't recommend the use of distributed ledger technology within such systems. Um, in, in the, we have seen that systems use it for like storing also a scheme, right? So in a decentralized manner, they try to distribute the scheme such that everybody can receive the right information about issuers, for instance, the public keys. And yeah, in the end, we have the European Digital Identity Initiative. It gives opportunities to empower citizens to be in control, in sole control of their identity. But as I have shown, there are also some drawbacks that we still need to address. So I also, it's a call to action for everybody here who wants that this goes in the right direction. Because within the European Union, it was also one point was that we have some unique identifier for every citizen within Europe, so such that we can have, yeah, uh, uh, can identify everyone, and I think we, we don't want that as a community here, at least. And yeah, that's the end of my talk. And so we still have some time for a Q&A. Thank so thank you very much. And if there are any questions, please line up at the microphones in the middle of the room. Do have some time if anyone wants to know anything. Hmm. Okay. First front microphone, please. Hi. You mentioned, Hi. and it's on the slide, that a distributed ledger is not re recommended by the BSI. Could you tell a little bit more about that, about the whys? And the whys? Yeah, because they argue that the uh, Technology is not major enough, and it gives more risk than it benefits an actual system. So I don't have all the details now in mind, but I referenced it. So yeah, I asked you then to, to look up if you really want to know all the details, what, what they write in their report. So yeah, that's... OK, next question. Fun. Hello, and thank you for your talk. Um, let's assume that everyone uh, every wallet now has those verifiable credentials. We don't have interoperability yet. What would you recommend? How should the wallets then work together? If we don't have interoperability, you mean? Let's assume we all implemented this, and it's just a standard, and you know there, there are still limits. You don't have the interoperability just by implementing the standard. So what if we now have all those verifiable credentials, how should we continue to yeah, actually question. get interoperability? Yeah, exactly. So to increase the interoperability even further. So I think what we need is some agreement within the community also to think about which kind of crypto we want to support, what, what is really the good crypto, um, for instance, right? what, what IMA currently implements uh, parts of 
the identity mixer of IBM that we kind of standardize this and make it kind of a library so other systems can just load this library and then have the crypto yeah, included in the system already. So I think it needs to go into that direction that we have some agreement on the good crypto and then maybe have different libraries that implement this different cryptographic systems so other I didn't, yeah, other decentralized systems can easily implement it or use it, let's say, right? Okay, uh, next one. Hello, uh, I uh, would like to, uh, uh, no, uh, to remi remind you that uh, we uh, had a talk about bring your own identity on, the, on Friday, which allowed uh, uh, authentication on any server by using one identity provider. And maybe a week after this talk, we can have a little chat how, how your IRMA project can uh, coincide with, my, uh, with our Bring Your Own Identity project. And uh, the designer of, uh, of Bring Your Own Identity uh, will uh, be here in, in a while. And uh, maybe that's interesting, uh, because what we did, we uh, created a system uh, mm -hmm. that... Uh, uh, to prevent to have to authentic to have credentials on all those services as Google, uh, Facebook, and so on, uh, to be uh, removed and be delegated to your own identity provider. And uh, because this talk is all also very much about identity, maybe there are interesting causes, uh, the coincidence, but, so to speak. But if this is not really a question, but yeah, yeah. maybe I, well, I want to point out maybe. Something can be combined uh, with, your, with IRMA yeah. and uh, bringing your own identity. But if I understand correctly, you say that you then have different your identity stored at one identity provider, but then it's also centralized in a way, right? So that's also risk. Indeed, what I was thinking of, hey, that's also a problem because when the identity provider goes down, you can't identify anymore. But mm -hmm. that's what you solved, and uh, yeah. maybe that can be combined. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe okay. we can talk later also. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> so, so uh, apologies if I miss uh, I missed most of your talk, but um, the uh, so I was paying attention to these verifiable claims work attached to the W3C from pretty early because I had somebody dragged me into being involved in the um, in the e payments thing. Um, the the there okay, there was a lot of incompetence there from the beginning, but. Um, but one of the things that kind of stuck out to me, and apologies again if you've already touched on this, but you really don't want uh, any identity system that is sort of general purpose and relocatable against different things and that reveals attributes of people. Uh, so, one of, if you go through like the verifiable claims, like the, the, their documents, if you go through like their their use cases documents, it talks about um, it talks about using like for example to prove you have a job to get a bank account, which okay that's fine. But how often do you open a bank account? It's perfectly fine to ask your employer for a letter. Uh, whereas what's much more likely to ha where that's where that feature would get used much more likely much more often would be when you're going to apply for a job because an HR person generally prefers people to already have jobs and so they'll just filter everybody because that's how bureaucracies sometimes work mm. and if you if you go through all of their use cases like you can pretty much just flip it on its head and say how can this be misused and pretty much all of the attribute use cases can be misused so uh, my general feeling is so the main, th so the question, apologies for this not being a question, but the question part of this is, have you looked at Brian Ford's proof of personhood parties? Because the, in Brian Ford's model, there are no attributes. It's just you have, um, it's a function that maps uh, a, a context to unique identity. Mm. And so then there's no, there's no, there's no need for, uh, or then we have no attributes, we just have. Um, in a given context, I have a unique identity, and then I have another one and another identity, and there's no. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, you mean you get the identity from the government, for instance, right? Which, which has some unique identifier? Or? Um, in his model, uh, so he's 
has this anarchisty thing. Essentially, they want these proof of personhood parties where people b produce, but de facto, the proof of personhood parties are a side government. So yes, it's coming from a government, but it's not the government. It's this like anarchisty construct. But you could do it issued by a government too. Uh, so yeah, I don't really understand it correctly yet. You're like, yeah, maybe we'll talk after. Yeah. And time is up, sorry. But he will be available afterwards, I'm yeah. sure. And thank you very much for the talk. I think you were the first person who tripled the audience during talking. So please give him a round of applause, which is at least triple <laughs> to before.